it's magnified too, and then I it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very soft-spoken person. If you if you've listened to me on the podcast, by the way, anybody listen to the podcast, treatment-free beekeeping podcast? All right, we've got a few. Anybody in the Treatment Free Beekeepers Facebook group? A few more, very nice. Uh, yeah, so if you're if you're interested in treatment free beekeeping, you should check those out. Uh, I'm I'm here providing my services as an educator, especially to new beekeepers. Uh, in case you missed, my name is Solomon Parker. I've been keeping bees for 14 years, totally treatment free. In fact, my 14th anniversary will be coming up here. Uh, April 26th is my beekeeping birthday. I, uh, I started out, my, my family motto is if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. And so when I started out, I started by buying 20 packages and became a beekeeper on the first day with 20 packages. Uh, Baptism by fire is very, very fun. Of course, back then you could buy a package for $30. It's a bit of a different situation here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I came down with a cold this last week, uh, right before the last conference that I did, and so when you, when you catch the, uh, the video of that on YouTube, which I'll be posting here before long, you can watch the video of that, you'll see me drinking gallons of green tea and honey and uh, trying to keep up with my throat. So here I'm trying to speak up a little bit, hopefully I'll, I'll last the hour. <clears throat> I'm a treatment-free beekeeper. Um, there's a lot of confusion as to what that means, so I just want to just want to lay out some definitions first of all. I don't use anything. I don't use hard chemicals, the the, the traditional stuff like um, like apistan and teramycin and any of the rest of them. Don't use any of those. I don't use any soft chemicals, uh, things that are used by <coughs> people today, various essential oils. Um, sugar. Um, see, I don't. I, I get up here and I can't even tell you what I don't use because I I was out there looking at the treatments on the table like, wow, I've never seen this in person before. <laughs> um, I, I really just don't know because I don't use any of it. Uh, and I also don't use brood breaks, which might be a surprise to some of you. Um, I I look at methods like uh, the OTS method and um, what. Adrian was talking about in the breakout room this last hour upstairs. I think those are great methods for getting started to help you develop <coughs> your um, holy grail, like, uh, like Adrian was talking about. But ultimately, my focus is on bees that not only don't need chemical and other sorts of treatments, but don't need intensive management practices to keep them alive. Because to me, when you have to do all that work if you're doing a bunch of work so that your bees stay alive, no matter what that work is or how, how soft or organic that may be, you're still producing bees that are dependent upon you for survival. And that's what I want to get away from. So this has come to be known a little pejoratively as the bond method. Does anybody know what the bond method refers to? Live and let die. Live and let die, that's right. <laughs> Right now is when I would I would play the the Guns N' Roses song if I had it. But <laughs> so treatment free beekeeping the way I do it, which I don't with with the brood breaks and things like that, I don't hold that against anybody. Like that's that's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and with proper proper direction of that process, it can be a big step in the right direction by eliminating bees that don't survive, obviously, uh, and by rapidly multiplying bees that do survive and do thrive. And that's what we ultimately want to get to, if not just making it through the winter, but a goodly portion of the hives thriving. Now we can never achieve zero losses, nor should we try, because that is not <coughs> natural. It is normal and natural for a certain number of hives to die every year. And so we, in treatment free beekeeping, do what uh, Kirk Webster calls using the mites to eliminate my weak stock. Using the mites as a tool, rather than seeing them as a pest. Uh, 
And so ultimately I get to the point where I don't typically have big problems with mites. My hives die of the same stuff everybody else's hives die of, uh, starvation, um, moisture, things like that, right? Mites are becoming for me just like, um, like wax moths have become for beekeeping in general, where they are something that doesn't take over a hive and kill a hive anymore. There's something that comes in <coughs> at the end right as the hive is going off the edge. So treatment for beekeeping is based on the concepts of natural selection. Now there's a couple things I need to explain there because we all think of, most of us think of natural selection as survival of the fittest, right? That's what we've been told. But that's not precisely true. There's always more detail we can get into with these things. Um, natural selection really produces organisms that are best adapted to survive in the environment where they are, all right? It's not just the, the strongest survive all the time. It's the, <coughs> the creature that has the right traits, or the right mix of traits to be able to survive and reproduce where they are and in the conditions that they're in. So to connect to that, when we talk about natural selection, natural doesn't refer to the absence of human intervention. Natural refers to the natural consequence of the situation in the environment, right? So if we're doing anything to a hive, we are, by very nature of interfering, we are causing selection to take place. Uh, like, like Adrian says, we don't know if the bees are surviving because of us or in spite of us. It's an important thing to understand because there's a lot of things going on, many of them we don't even know or realize, but they're having an effect on the bee colonies. And we want our inputs ultimately to be of the sort that don't, that, that we're not re needed, we're not required in order to, to produce um, survival of the bees. Hey look, I'm on the Facebook Live and I've got 12 people watching. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm down to nine. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they noticed that they were, I noticed them, anyway. Um, so when we're doing this, we're developing bees that need our help or bees that don't need our help, right? When we treat for mites, we produce bees that require treatment for mites because that's the natural environment they're in that's going to require them to need that in the future, and they're being developed for that requirement. Okay. <coughs> At the same time, when we're treating against mites or any other disease, uh, we're producing mites that are able to survive the treatments. Generally, all treatments over time become less and less effective. That's an important thing to understand. There's a reason why very few people still use Apistan, because it's kind of, uh, despite, uh, and there's other facts to Apistan too, it's a pretty nasty chemical. So I look at it like we want to develop a proper predator-prey relationship, because in nature we have a good example we've all seen on the Discovery Channel or Nature or whatever, um, we have cheetahs and gazelle, right? So in the savannah, we have gazelle, which are the prey animal. <coughs> they eat grass, the cheetahs eat the gazelle. A gazelle really just wants to eat grass and make more gazelle. The cheetah wants to eat gazelle and make more cheetahs. <laughs> Pretty basic stuff here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean to call any of you stupid, I just gotta lay it out for somebody who is <laughs> So don't take it personal. Um, so the gazelle, they run really fast, and they zigzag like this. The cheetahs run really fast, and they don't zigzag quite as much, but they're trying to keep up with the gazelle, because they need to eat and make more of the cheetahs. Um, if, if the cheetahs became too good at their job, they would eat all the gazelle, and they would starve to death, 
there'd be too many cheetahs and, and that's, what <coughs> that's what we saw in the beginning with varroa mites when it first happened. The bees had no, um, or at least not much defense, much natural defense against the mites. Mel pointed out earlier that he, he noticed that bees that had a natural brood break in the summer were able to survive the mites. That's one trend. Bees that naturally supersede over in a certain period at a certain time. That's a trait that a certain proportion of the bees had. And because they had that trait that allowed them to survive, their genetics then added, took precedence in the population. So we get more bees that survive that way. Over time, we've, we've noticed other traits. And I want to make I want to make the point that there is no um, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic. There's no magic. I don't believe in magic at all. There's nothing. There's no specific trait that makes suddenly makes bees treatment free and survivor bees. It's a combination of traits expressed in varying varying levels, and even uh, among various castes within the hive. So you all know that a queen will go out and mate with uh, maybe 10 to 15, 20 drones. That produces 10 to whatever 15 number of subpopulations within the hive. And each one of those populations is going to have slightly different traits. So it may be that only one of the uh, families in the hive will have the traits necessary to to deal with the mites in whatever way they can find. You only need just enough, just enough combination between different traits and different families within the hive to produce a hive that can deal with the mites. Um, this is a process that never ends because the mites are also wanting to survive. They're wanting to eat bees and make more mites. Um, we, it is my contention, and some of you might argue with this, and we can have that conversation at some time, that if we had never treated in this country, we would not have a mite problem today. We would have lost a lot of our commercial beekeepers, would have gone out of business and gone bankrupt. And it may have been such that the, um, <coughs> the commercial almond production business might have collapsed. So we need to be, Mel was talking earlier about how he was an optimist, and uh, Adrian was talking about how he was a pessimist. I call myself a realist, which is a pessimist with good PR. <laughs> um, but I want to be in contact with the facts. I want to know what's happening and what the costs to different things would be. And so now at this stage, as I'm trying to expand the idea of treatment-free beekeeping, um, we just need to be aware of what the costs can be. And that's why, I mean, it's listed in your programs as um, treatment-free beekeeping, but the real true name of this talk is let them die. <laughs> the case for doing it the hard way. Um, some groups like that title. <laughs> oh, I want to hear that one. And other groups retitle it. So <laughs> this, this is what happens. How do you know what breed of bee when you buy enough that you have? Is there certain territories from down south that certain bees come from that have that trait that compared to? That's a that's a really important issue that I <coughs> need to address. Um, I do not recommend buying bees at all. I've come to the point where as a person who sells bees, I tell people not to buy bees, especially when you're up here in the, in the, the colder areas. Don't buy bees from down south. They just don't have what it, what, what it takes up here. And that's, that's a huge, um, for those of you who bought packages and experienced a package losses, um, from the numbers that I've seen from the Bee Informed National Survey, as far as I can put together, something like 45% of packages die in their first year every year. If you bought a new car and it had a 45% chance of blowing up, <laughs> would you buy that? 
But we tell you, new bee, I can't say young bee, beekeepers because that's not the case. New beekeepers, uh, new beekeepers, in my experience these days, seem to be age of 40 or better. So uh, it's a different situation than it used to be when I started. Um, but we tell new beekeepers that the way it's supposed to be done is that you're supposed to go and buy a beginner's kit and go order your packages or order your nukes. And I think to have a sustainable beekeeping world today, we've got to get away from that model. We've got to get toward buying bees. If you need to buy bees, if you, if you can't come up with them any other way, get them from your friends. Give them a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks or whatever you're going to spend on a package, and get a split from from somebody like Adrian who's got overwintered nukes. That nuke or split or whatever he's going to get, uh, whatever he's going to sell you is going to be the chances of, of that dog are going to be far less because those bees are proven to be able to survive here. He's done it. We've seen it. Um, so that's an important thing. The other one that is very important to me that I'm really starting to promote these days is, is using swarm traps. Take your empty equipment at the end of winter, if you've lost bees or if you're starting up new, buy used equipment from somebody, get it cheap, because that makes an excellent swarm trap. And you can catch free bees and get free bees. And I feel that the most important problem that I see with new beekeepers who start and then fail and quit is the fact that the bees cost money. When you're paying money for bees, you are invested in that, right? When you buy a car, you want it to last a few years. You want to get your money's worth that way. When you're buying bees and you've spent a bunch of money on them, you're emotionally invested in it and that leads to a lot of fear and fear leads to anger, and anger leads to the dark side. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or for me, the dark side is treating. Right? If you're afraid that your bees are going to die, you're going to want to do everything you can to stop that happening. But I understand that. That's that's human nature. Right? We're invested in it. So, um, look into swarm traps if you want. More information on how to do that, check out Jason Bruns' work at letembe.com, L-E-T-M-B-E. -E. He is the guy. He's writing a book. It's going to be called like the Swarm Trapper's Reference or something. Uh, I cannot, I've had him on the podcast a couple of times and we'll have him again. He's excellent. Because when you have, when you have free bees and maybe you caught somebody's swarm out of their hive that was treated and they die, that's okay. When you go fishing, you lose a fish off the line, you, you throw the pole in the woods and give up, and no, you bait it up again and you go again. Fish are basically free and swarms are basically free. But back to what we're talking about here. Um, what time do we have? I'm gonna keep track, oh, it's on the screen. 11.20, awesome, great. I'm working on an hour and a half, two hour talk here, so I'm gonna condense it way down running fast and loose, and I'm all jacked up on caffeine, so it's great. <laughs> this is like, when I get done with these things, I feel better, because at the beginning I'm a little nervous, at the end I'm like jacked up on adrenaline, it's like a great time. It's like a roller coaster. All right, so when I started beekeeping, when I was doing my research and getting into beekeeping in the fall of 2002, um, that was the year that Michael Bush had his first bees over winter successfully treatment free. Uh, Dee Lesby was still on the scene talking about treatment free beekeeping. Well, it wasn't called treatment free beekeeping back then. They called it organic beekeeping and small cell and things like that. If you want to hear about small cell, I can talk about that some other time. Um, one of the biggest criticisms we had was there's no such thing as um, Wolf resistant sheep. <laughs> right? you, can't, you can't adapt away from the mites. The mites are going to kill your hive, so you have to treat. And that's what we were told. I didn't have the, the presence of mind at the time to think about the fact that there are wolf resistant sheep. Before humans came along, all sheep were wolf resistant sheep. 
right? There's those little, those big horn sheep that run up the mountainside and where the wolves can't get to, and you know, wolf-resistant sheep. We figured out that mites are the same way, right? There's this myth that the mites came along and killed off all of the feral hives, and only we only still have bees in this country because um, because we figured out treatments, and then from the treatments we were then able to develop treatment-free bees. However, I see no good solid evidence for that. I have talked to plenty of people who um, kept bees before the mites showed up. In fact, my my great uncle Wayne was a good example. He had he was running about 50 hives back in the, the late 80s, and mites came along. <coughs> Somebody told him about mites. He didn't believe them. He didn't think that mites existed. He didn't think they were a problem. But he did lose 45 of his hives. But he didn't lose all of them. And these were treatment-free bees. He was a hillbilly guy back up in the woods keeping bees in this little pocket valley that's completely isolated from everywhere else. He wasn't getting bees from anywhere else. They were in his valley and he lost 90% of them, but that 10% came back, and they're still there now, and now I have a yard right next door to where his bees were, and I'm seeing the bees that have been living feral in that valley for the last 25 years. <clears throat> so that's my personal evidence, and I've heard many stories of other people who, who had um, feral hives and, and cavities and trees and things and buildings that were <coughs> Occupied continuously from beginning, from before the mites showed up till currently. Now it is normal for a hive to die out every so often, um, but you can tell if a hive is occupied continuously because in the spring, um, before swarm season, if there's bees coming into that hive with pollen, you know that is an active living hive. It's not just being robbed out and being repopulated later by another swarm. The, the other thing that I realized over time was that we've had this happen before. Okay, like I mentioned, wax moths. When wax moths were first introduced to this country, <coughs> accounts vary, but somewhere back in the early 1800s, in that era, um, they were known as the bee wolf. We get back to the wolf resistant sheep. These wax moths would move into a hive. The, the little grubs would eat up all the comb, the bees would abscond and leave, right? They couldn't handle it. Over time, bees that were able to get rid of the, the eggs or the, the larva of the wax moth were able to basically eliminate the wax moth problem. So today, we no longer refer to the wax moth as the bee wolf. It's just something that comes and eats your comb when, you, when a hive is about to die or has died. Right? It's, it's taken its place in the, the, the scope of the hive. Another example is American foul brood. Over many, many years, because American foul brood is such a vicious, virulent disease, we came up with the idea of burning a hive that gets it. It's better to sacrifice that hive to keep it from spreading to other hives. What we were doing there is eliminating weak stock Instead of letting it spread, which in nature, hives are, are miles and miles apart often. Well, at least, you know, apart. And so when a disease propagates through the population, <coughs> individual hives are not, it's, it's, not an it's not an epidemic. However, today, because we take all of our hives, or half of the kept hives in the country end up in California in the spring for almond pollination. We take all of our diseases, we stick them together in one few square mile area, and then we take them all back out and, and, and distribute them to the rest of the country. That spreads diseases among the beekeeping, the bee population in a way that was completely impossible before migratory beekeeping. And that's why we get huge die-offs when normally a disease would take years to spread 
mites would have taken several years to spread across the field. But because we move all the bees together, it gets all spread out. Tracheal mites. Where did they go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Varroa mites came along and tracheal mites were suddenly not a problem anymore because they didn't matter. Varroa was worse. Anything that survived Varroa was already, <clears throat> already done with tracheal mites. So there's a, one important question that I need to, need to answer, and I want to make sure to get to this before I run out of time because it's, it's really important, and that's the question of mite balls. I'm sure you've all heard, as I have, that if you don't treat your bees, they're gonna get overrun with mites, and then they're gonna get robbed out by other hives, and those mites are gonna be spread to other hives, increasing their mite load and causing them to crash also. Is anybody familiar with this? It's called a mite ball. I don't believe in mite balls, and there's a few reasons why I don't. Um, number one, especially up here in the, in the frozen north, um, hives typically die from mites when they do die of mites after most flying is done. Right, so you get to the problem where, for the, the, the problem for the mites, where they kill the hive off and they kill themselves off too. And by not treating, we're actually selecting for mites that are self-limiting. Mites that won't kill the hive, because when they kill a hive, they kill themselves also. That's a predator prey thing, you need to remember. Um, the other important one is that um, what about the feral bees? What about the swarms that escaped from treated hives that have no defense against Varroa? And they set up uh, they set up shop in a tree hollow or a house or a barn or somewhere, and they crash from mites. You can't treat all the feral hives. It just can't be done. So blaming a treatment-free beekeeper for mites, what would be a good example? <clears throat> it's like blaming umbrellas for rain? I don't know. It's, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Because if you think about it, the mites are there already. If you have a, a hive that can't survive mites, it's not gonna survive whether it's got a few or many. Ultimately, it's gonna crash. I had a couple more points on that, but I forget them. Um, I also get the question oftentimes, should I do mite tests? I've never done a mite test. I wouldn't know how to tell you how to do it. And the main reason is because if I do a mite test and I find that there's a high number of mites in the hive, again, there's another question, how do you know what's too high? Somebody tells you, I guess. Um, but they don't know either. If I do have a huge number of mites in a hive, what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna do anything, so why do I even need to know that they're there? <laughs> still working? Um, but secondly, my, my metric for measuring how well bees do is not how many mites they have. If a hive can survive with a million mites and make honey and be gentle and productive, why do I care what mites are in there? Survival is the only necessary thing for natural selection, right? Survival is the only thing I'm worried about. And that's why a lot of the, all of the studies that have been done on small cell beekeeping are totally flawed because they measure mite counts rather than survival. Mite counts don't matter. Survival matters. I had a hive, um, I think it was winter of 2010, I, I went and was doing my final inspection and everything for winter, getting everybody battened down, see if, see if anything needed fed or anything. And I came to this hive and it had mites everywhere. Like you, it's like a nightmare scenario, it's full of, there were mites. You could see mites crawling across the comb, you could see mites in the 
brood cells ready to be capped. You can see mites on the bees crawling around. <coughs> like, it's, do you look at this hive and you say, I don't even, this is gone. I'm not even worried about this. I'm not gonna feed it. I'm not gonna put an entrance reducer on. It's just done, just not worry about it. So I had 11 hives going into winter that year, and I lost one. It wasn't that one. <laughs> I can only conclude that my counts don't matter. It's the bees that matter. It's the bees surviving that matter. So I want to make sure also to <coughs> give you, oh, before I get to that, one more thing. Um, why do I need to let the hive die when I can help? You could do something like uh, one of the soft treatments, or um, you could even decide that you're going to kill the queen because we know this hive's not doing well and combine it with another, another hive and just not worry about it. But because I don't know the actual number of mites that's the critical number of mites, why not just let them find out? By killing things, arbitrarily, I might be eliminating a trait that we haven't discovered yet. You've heard of traits like um, varroa sensitive hygiene and uh, uh, mite biters and ankle biters. Um, what other traits do we have? Hygienic. Hygienic, ball brood, grooming, um, maintaining mites only in the drone brood. If you have your mites in the drone brood, and not as a worker brood, you can withstand a huge mite load because the drones are taking all the damage. The workers are fine. That hive doesn't need to have any other method of controlling varroa other than just keeping the mites on the drone brood. But like I said, we need a, we need a mixture. And we can't find what bees are able to survive unless, unless we allow them to actually do that. It's like putting your antelope in a trailer. Now, if you're gonna get your four by four out there, a little trailer, you got your antelope in there, you're gonna shoot off down through the Serengeti at 70, 75, 80 miles an hour, just fast enough to get away from the cheetah. <laughs> Invariably though, you're gonna get a flat tire and now your, your gazelle has gotten lazy and you can't outrun a cheetah. <laughs> so what happens when you as a beekeeper pass on and your bees are unable to take care of themselves by themselves? You've now left a bunch of, of overfed gazelle sitting out in the yard waiting for the first cheetah to come along and clean out the whole crew. If you don't let the antelope actually run, you don't know how fast it can run. And like I mentioned before, antelopes are not trying to outrun cheetahs on straight line speed. There's zigzaggers. So there's, a, there's something in there that we miss when we try to measure something. Because when we're measuring mites, we're, we're measuring uh, like hygienic behavior, if we're focusing on hygienic behavior. Uh, typically the test they use is they a little ring on a piece of brood and they pour um, liquid nitrogen in there. My bees don't come across liquid nitrogen that often. <laughs> so where is it might be a, a good test to figure out what's going on, it's not perfect. It's, it's missing what's going on there. So I want, I like to be totally um, practical. This is, this is my more philosophical talk, so I like to, I like to be practical. So I want to explain um, some common mistakes and some things that I call failure modes. Things that if you do these things, it's, there's a good chance it's going to lead to failure. And I don't want failure. And I, and I define failure by giving up. Right? Losing all your hives, that's not failure. Losing all your hives and giving me your old equipment and giving up, that's failure. Because I don't want your old equipment, because a lot of times it's A-frame, and I use 10-frame. <laughs> so I'm just going to sell it anyway. Um, so a, a good, 
one of the main ones that I've, I've encountered over the years, very often, is people that just stop treating. And you've heard this, I'm sure, um, with new beekeepers, and they, they're, I'm gonna start beekeeping and I'm gonna be treating it free. It's like, okay, well, what else are you, any, is there anything else that you're gonna do to, to adjust the situation? Because we know that if you just stop treating, your results are gonna be pretty poor. And if you only have a couple of hives, one or two, your chances of 100% loss are gonna be pretty high. <coughs> the more hives you have, the more rolls of the dice you have to find that balance of traits <coughs> that's gonna let the bee survive. So I focus, for this, I focus totally on genetics and rolling the dice as many times as possible. And I'll talk this afternoon in my expansion model beekeeping talk about the most efficient ways to increase your number of hives as rapidly as possible so that you can, rather than trying to come back from a big loss, you can get out ahead of your losses. <coughs> and then when you do lose some, because you will, you'll just be back to where you were because it's a whole lot easier to to, if, you, if, you're, if you're very fortunate and you don't lose any, it's a whole lot easier to come back to five from eight than it is from two. So I, I don't want to see people fail. Uh, one of the other things I talked a little bit before was yearly replacement of packages. That's a huge failure mode. Someone buys their starter kit, they buy the packages, put it in, um, it dies, as it often does and they go and buy a package from probably the same producer that they bought the year before. I could give you the old axiom about uh, <coughs> insanity being doing the same thing and, and expecting different results, but I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you do something that don't work, that doesn't work, especially if you do it multiple times and it doesn't work, do something else. <coughs> seems simple. Just do something else. Try something else. Anything else. Um, like I said, I focus now on teaching people <coughs> how to build really good swarm traps, uh, which doesn't require you to carry around boxes in your trunk and waiting for a call from somebody to come get a swarm. Those, those can be fun. That's like fishing for bass, but it's not, it's not convenient, especially for people that have day jobs. Um, so building really good swarm traps and learning how to expand from the bees you have, that's where uh, getting started, especially Mel's methods can come in. You can, you can split up rapidly, quickly, uh, inexpensively, efficiently, and that'll give you more rolls of the dice to get good bees. Oh, I'm down to two. <laughs> it was a first try, I had to, I had to see how it worked. Um, and then kind of I mentioned this a little bit before, too few hives. One or two hives is gonna give you only one or two rolls of the dice. It's much easier to combine hives and, and come back to some number that you're comfortable with than it is to come back from a small number trying to get back up to a big, bigger number. I recommend at least five. Those of you that have uh, live in HOAs and places or city limits where you're required to uh, keep a limited number of hives, get together with some of your friends in your neighborhood who want to be beekeepers. And if you're only allowed to keep two hives on your property, which is common for some, some areas, then each of you keep two. Because if something happens, if you have one hive and the hive goes queenless, you're then stuck at the mercy of some queen producer or somebody who's gonna send you a queen in the mail. Who knows what that quality of the quality of that queen will be? Who knows if she's going to arrive alive? Uh, and if you if she doesn't arrive alive, and then you have to order another one, and it takes too much time, and, and a lot of times you'll get to be in the case where it's too late. However, if your hive goes clean, and you have a friend that can give you a, uh, a frame of open brood, so you put a frame of open brood in there once a week for several weeks until the problem fixes itself and you can be the person who helps them when they have the same problem later on. So we can form these little cooperatives and uh, get away from the buy-in model 
get away from the model where we, um, in treating, we're in the model where we're, where we're popping pills to solve problems. I think today's big problem is we get, we get enamored with buying things to solve our problems. And I think we need to trust each other and help each other. <coughs> Well, I've covered pretty much everything, and I wanted to leave leave uh, plenty of time for Q and A because that's that's important to me. Because I, I may have got up here and, and said a bunch of things really quickly, and I want to make sure that you are understanding what I'm saying and that you are getting your concerns addressed. So, yeah. Can you repeat the last